Mm-hmm. Oh, that's far away. <laughs> Always forget to check the audio, huh? Oh, mic's good. All right. Hey, everybody. I was going to do a regular video on this, but um, everybody's out of the house right now. Uh, and so I figured, let's get a quick not regular video going while I can. Uh, I had to go over this for the podcast. We did our podcast yesterday. The camera's a little better. Don't mess with it. I mess something up. And, and um, there are some changes in here. The biggest change, I guess I'll go ahead and talk about it first. Um, we didn't talk about it first in the podcast, but uh, there's a lot of data sheets missing for models in the codex that are in the index but aren't in the codex. A uh, librarian on a bike, chaplain on the bike, um, tyrannic war veterans, damned legionnaires are not in here. Uh, that might be a different reason for them. Maybe they're going to get their own codex, which would be cool. But uh, for a lot of the others, the reason that that is is um, if you know anything about Chapter House and GW and the issues that they've had, uh, then you'll understand this. If not, just go ahead and Google that. Lots of information on what happened. But GW is basically, <clears throat> and eight as, as part of this process, uh, maybe why they accelerated eight a little bit, it feels like, is they are no longer going to produce data sheets or profiles for models that they, uh, f for, that they don't make models for. Okay, that's that's the basic thing. Uh, the first wave of this was way back with Tyranids, and their, when their codex came back out way back when in sixth edition, I believe. <clears throat> and so now, now they're pretty much just with what what's gone down with that whole situation is um, they're just trying to protect their IP. It kind of sucks in a way for some of us as the models. For now, uh, on the Warhammer community side, it's hard to find, but if you dig, you can find it. There is a little blurb about um, being able to use the profiles from the index for things that aren't in the codex. So, yeah, there are there are um, a, a few uh, things, and you'll notice them as you go through. And some of the ones I mentioned are... Um, and, and also, weapon options also, like... Uh, Honor God lost the ability to swap out their power axes because the models they have have the power axes. Um, Dreadnoughts lost uh, twin auto cannon, twin heavy bolter, twin heavy flamer options. Um, Termi librarian lost storm bolter, storm shield options. And um, tech marine on a bike is index only. Apothecary on a bike index only. Uh, company Ancient on the bike index. Company Vets on a bike is index only. So a lot of these are index only. They are no longer. Um, they aren't in the codex here. All right, big. I'm going to go over the big changes before we just look through the codex a little bit. Um, <clears throat> most of these had a power level change as well, but I'm going to go over the point changes for the units, uh, weapon options, etc, etc, that changed. Um, Plasma Incinerator dropped in points by uh, three points. Uh, Sky Spear Missile Launcher dropped to zero points. Went from 30 to zero. Boom! Down. Uh, Special Issue Bolt Gun went from three to two points. The Thunderfire Cannon, the weapon itself, the weapon option Thunderfire Cannon, Went from 30 to 0. Lightning Claws went from 9 for a single, 13 for the pair, to 8 for a single, 12 for the pair. Helps a tiny little bit with Lightning Claw Terminators and such. Um, Power Fist dropped from 20 to 12, which is a pretty good option. Because um, uh, I think it was it's D3 damage or something like that. And um, I was like, why would you take that versus the one that's 3 whole damage? And they're the, they were the same points. So Thunder Hammers for characters dropped from 25 to 21. Thunder Hammers for any other Marine, uh, 20 to 16. <clears throat> a Librarian and Terminator armor dropped 2 points from 145 to 143. 
Drop Clouds had a 10 point loss to 93 points. Land Speeder Storms also dropped 10 points. Centurion Assault Squads had a 20 point drop. They dropped from 73 to 53 points. A Chapter Champion went from 65 to 60. A Company Champion went from 56 to 40. An Ironclad Dreadnought is now the cheap Dreadnought option. He went from 120 points to 80 points. No weapons were lost. No options were lost from him. He's the same model, same all of the stats and everything. Except that now he is uh, 40 points cheaper for the Dreadnought, the Ironclad Dread. So that is really cool. And I have an Ironclad Dread. So yeah, he might be coming out. Um, attack, all, pretty much all bikes had a drop. Attack bikes went from 45 to 35, and that includes if you use them in a regular bike squad. Uh, regular bikes went from 31 to 25. Land speeders, the regular ones, not the storms, went from 80 to 70, so also a 10 point drop. Scout bikes went from 25 to 23. Centurion Devastator squads are, are one of the few examples of a point increase. They went from 65 to 80, which is amazingly big <laughs> considering all the other drops and stuff but uh, apparently they needed it I haven't played with my Centurion um, Devastators in a battle and seen um, how they do so uh, apparently though they needed that change Hellblasters squad so even a Primaris one of the new units has had a point adjustment Went from 20 to 18. Now, um, if you noticed earlier, I said the weapon that they have, the, event, the plasma weapon that they have, I also had a point drop. It's a total of five points per model drop between the regular standard weapon they have, um, they had, because now they have two options. They have a salt option and a heavy option also now. And the model itself, which is five point per uh, dude, so it's 25 points over the five man squad, which is a huge amount of points. Uh, a very big shift for the Hellblaster squad as far as points. Um, definitely uh, between a, a couple of Hellblaster squads, if you, you were running those, uh, you've got a whole lot more points now for some other things. Uh, most of the vehicles dropped. <clears throat> Predator went from 102 to 90. Stalker from 90 to 80. Um, Vindicator from 160 to 135. Whirlwind from 90 to 75. Um, the Thunderfire Gunner, the, the Tech Marine, he dropped from 36 to 26 now. So you, that's a 40-point drop um, so far in a Thunderfire Cannon. But uh, the cannon itself, the model, the cannon model, actually went from 28 to 55. Um, so that's a 20... Uh, what is that? Don't do math on camera. Uh, 27? 27 point increase? Something like that? I think so. 27 point increase? <clears throat> so overall, it's about a 14 point change to the lower for Thunderfire Cannons. Um, the, most of the Ultramarine characters had point drops too. It's like, what? Ultramarines? <laughs> Um, Chaplain Cassius was the biggest one. He lost 40 points. He went from 138 to 98. Um, Calgar went from 250 to uh, 200, so 50 points. Uh, the thing with Calgar, though, is he is one of the models that has suffered from a loss of a profile. Uh, they do make, and it's weird, they do make a Calgar model in the regular uh, Artificer Power Armor. He's um, out of stock right now, so maybe he's not coming back. Uh, he's going to get redone or something. Because his that profile is the one that's not in the index. The one where his seven in Terminator armor is the one in the index. Or the codex, I mean, in the codex. They're both in the index, but the, only the Terminator armor version is here in the codex. And so, um, yeah, interesting. Interesting that. Uh, Kronos went from 58 to 35. Antelion went from 89 to 75. The Emperor's Champion, the only not ultramarine guy who changed, went from 108 to 75, which is insane. The, I've seen the Emperor's Champion being played, seen what he can do. He is he's pretty good when you get him in there, and um, he's cheap now. 75 points for a character. He's, he, he, uh, yeah, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, wow. Uh, these are show notes from the... Look, I actually have stuff to read off of because I had show notes from 
a podcast <laughs> that I burned up. Oh my goodness. Look at me actually having something to, I think that's about the end of that though. Because uh, there was more about changes. So this is the Codex. Um, I picked it up while I got the cards. Um, are they close? Yes. I got the cards. And I got this right here. These are technical objective things. And don't worry that this is open. Because I already did a video on it already. And I'm it's downloading actually right as we speak from the camera to um, my computer. I did a video yesterday on it. I just... Between the podcast and some other things that we're doing, I just haven't had um, time to do anything with that uh, footage. I'm just now downloading it. I spent um, pretty much all day yesterday editing the podcast footage. <clears throat> I say footage, audio, podcast audio. Ooh, okay, so we got some models in the way here, so let me move something. Oh, also... All the zombies are done. You can't see him on there, can you? All the zombies are done. All the zombies. Got them all done and based. All of them are done. All 30 of those. Um, all I've got left... To, this is all I've got left to do in the Undead Army. These three guys who I'm going to use as necromancers. And this version of uh, the little vampire lord dude. So... Not glued together because I see where it's going to be hard to get into some areas. So I'm going to paint these separately and then assemble them. And then clean up any anything that needs to be cleaned up that I can reach. So, four models. Um, yeah, five models to complete painting in the Admac, four in the Undead Army. Am I going to complete an army one day? Oh, and we started working on LT's Arcs. We did one of the killer cans right here. And he is base coated. All of these guys did this all by himself. These guys. Hey, mate, how you doing, Jam Jar? Yeah, LT base coated every single one of these. Ten of them. We're we're attempting to do them for the fate of Kodor. Uh, uh, first week, um, the the painting thing. We'll we'll do our best. Um, he gets easily distracted by other things he wants to do. It's still summer, and summer's coming to a quick end for them. The, um, they're going back to school um, next week. So I'll have more time, and things will get better on my schedule here, and I'll be able to put things out. His kids will be, most of them, all but Char Char. Char Char goes to school next year. Alrighty, so uh, this book is cool. I've... I haven't had much time to go through um, much of the fluff. I did read some of it. It's really designed, as you can say, like someone coming into the game who did, never played this game ever before. They really go into depth with um, the history and how to build a space marine and how a pri primary space marine, the differences, and Codex Heraldry. They got the big map. And uh, listing some of the areas and the warp intrusion and talk about various uh the various chapters uh, ultramarines of course are a big thing one thing i did notice and me and the guys on the podcast were talking about off air was the uh the large amount of um this is ultramarine second company supposedly of the primaris marines that are in here <laughs> in this <laughs> reinforcements that have been put in here uh, so interesting interesting thing you know we'll see primaris takes over how you been doing jam jar how's things going with you guys over there uh my favorite the imperial fists um some of the things i got i was kind of like yeah mm, duh <laughs> That is crazy. Uh, I'm a little. The only thing I'm worried about in this book overall, for me, is uh, the. I think it's the war a warlord trait. I think it's a warlord trait for the ultramarines. So this is all the cool fluff, and I'm just gonna. I know other people have, have gone over this, you know, because they got the codexes earlier. So I'm not gonna do any of it. This right here. This is right. This uh, page sixty-two, I believe. Yeah, sixty-two. 
right here is um, you can look this up right here and it explains lieutenants and how they came about right there that little piece of fluff right there on the bottom it's very interesting very interesting um, where they come from this is this I thought was interesting this picture right here looks exactly like the model that they've did come out with so that was really cool either they did this picture afterwards or this maybe might have been one of the concept arts for that model which is which is really cool really cool to see that um and they talk about all the different uh areas of the what kind of squads are for what they're supposed to do you get the cool hell blasters and the mix of things in here veterans and dreadnoughts I like that picture of the dreadnought it's the, the bigger one, the new one, I think. Um, and all the different vehicles. So we got the little fluffy version, and then in the back we have the uh, the actual data sheets, which is what we used to have, which was missing from some of the codexes later in 7th, which now we got back, and I like that. Of course we have our, you know, obligatory heavy metal pictures of all the the cool models so that we're all like, yeah, I want mine to look like that and have $10,000 of terrain. <laughs> the only problem is I would love to have $10,000 worth of terrain and have a big thing. And I would love it, except, man, I'm still painting this terrain. I got it. It's killing me. It's killing me because of the way I chose to paint it. It's my fault. I didn't paint like this where it's just like dry brushed over and done. I, I went, I went too far. But now I have to go too far with everything. And it, it's fine, though. Because I know, I know, even though it's going to take me a long, long time, when it's done, it's going to be pretty dang cool. <laughs> it's going to look good. So I, I'm fine with that. I've, I've resigned myself. You know, th th that's this is what I've done. I have to live with it and go. Um, the war gear list is, um, you'll notice it is less than what you have in the index. Because there are some options that aren't in here because GW doesn't make models that have those options. So, so like in the Dreadnought is where you'll see it the most. The Dreadnought Heavy Weapons, much smaller, much smaller. Um, and then we start out, you know, uh, as I said, uh, Marnius Calgar, they only have the one uh, profile for him in here. And all the other guys are in there interesting interesting noted things <clears throat> Klesora Khan they have his profile here this profile is not on a bike why because GW doesn't make uh, Dolbiob I do not know what that means but I'm sure you'll tell me <laughs> um, because GW doesn't make that model I believe uh, although you could use the Death Watch guy, I think, from the the Death Watch, um, what was it, Death Watch Overkill? He'd make a great model for the con on the bike. So, eh. but you know, we talked. I talked about that earlier in the podcast, so why that is. Um, where I'm trying to find it, it's right, where is it, where is it, here's it, this is very interesting. Uh, oh, it is there. Lieutenants. These are Primaris Lieutenants. This is Lieutenants. Character Infantry Lieutenants. Doesn't say Primaris in here at all, anywhere. This is Lieutenants in regular Space Marine armies. You can now put them in there. There's no model, I guess, right now. Maybe we're going to get a model really soon, and that's why this is in here. Um, but you could, you could, I mean, Stern Guard parts, uh, Vanguard parts, uh, command squad parts from regular you could just make a lieutenant up you could make you a decent lieutenant i probably have several models in my own that i've kit kit bashed up uh, for certain things that would make an awesome lieutenant so now you can have the lieutenants in your regular space marine armies and he does give that reroll wounds of one uh bubble within six inches so awesome awesome in your space marine armies you don't have to bring you don't have to do primaris if you don't want to you can have a lieutenant and I'm trying to get to the things I want to discuss. I don't want to go over profiles and stuff. I don't want to get into any of that. Most people have already. I uh, just want to point out a few of them. One is going to be next. It's going to be the 
the Primaris transport thing. Just want to kind of here. Well, here's the Hell Blasters where they have the assaults and the um, the heavy plasma incinerators. Now, I'm going to say for me personally, looking at this, uh, the assault plasma incinerator is one point more than the regular weapon they carry. But given its profile and given what you can do with it, I would probably be more inclined to equip my guys with that assault plasma incinerator personally. If I ever did um, Primaris guys and Hellblasters, they would. That's what I would give them is that assault plasma incinerator for sure. All right, so I'm gonna go through and just the repulsor. Now, if you look at these weapon options in here, this thing can be anything against anything. It's got las cannon options, Gatling guns, storm bolters. Um, it comes equipped with like uh, heavy bolters, Gatling guns, a couple heavy stubbers, anti-air heavy stubbers, crack storm grenade launchers, storm bolters, and auto launchers. It's just decked out. Uh, but this thing can run up to uh, probably 500 points or so, depending on what you throw on that thing. So it can get really expensive. Oh, what I really wanted to talk about. Yeah, look at all these armory. Anyway, I wanted to talk about the chapter tactics and this stuff in the back is what I really wanted to talk about. Um, Defenders of the Humanity, which is basically objective secured. For any Space Marine chapter, it's just all terrains. This is really good. That is a really good thing. And uh, that, with some of the stuff that you can do with command points and stuff, is a really powerful for Space Marines, being able to do that. Especially one of their, and I'll discuss it when I get there, but their um, unique objectives for Maelstrom. Um, Ultramarines get the good thing. Uh, we've all seen these chapter tactics. They've been leaked um, they have a pretty decent one because it's kind of like two things they get. They get the fallback and, uh, they get the leadership buff. Imperial Fists get two things, but they're like, uh, very situational, at least with the building thing. The Ignore's Cover thing, I think, is going to be more, it's going to come in more than people think. It's going to end up being more useful than people think. I think it's a good one. Um, it's not as crazy as some of these like the white scars tactic where they can you know <clears throat> they can advance extra two inches or you know the black tempers re-rolling failed charge rolls it's not something like that or the ultra means one or basically the feel no pain of the iron hands which is way cool <laughs> But I think it's going to come into handy. Um, the stratagems are awesome. Some of the standout ones are Born in the Saddle for only one command point. White Scars only. They can, uh, they can advance, shoot, and charge. It's crazy. That's crazy good. Um... Hellfire Shells would be a really good one to give to Imperial Fists because you usually have a lot of bolter weapons in Imperial Fists. And um, this is really good because what happens if you have a heavy, you use it, one of your heavy bolters, he makes only a single hit roll for the weapon. But if it hits, it does D3 mortal wounds. So that's crazy. Then you have Bolter Drill, which is an Imperial Fist only uh, stratagem. And basically, each time you roll a 6 for a bolt weapon, you immediately can roll for another attack, another hit roll. And those, of course, don't stack. So, uh, you have Orbital Bombardment, which comes in as a once per uh, game use 3 command point. But the thing about this is you, it's, it's Orbital Bombardment. Uh, you don't have to bring, like, a Chapter Master for this. It just, you need... It, um, an Adeptus Astartes Warlord. It, so any character that your Warlord can, as long as you have that guy, you can do this, which is pretty cool. And it doesn't cost points. It just costs command points. So it's not like, you know, you got to pay X amount to have this guy so you can have the Orbital Bombardment. No, you got it with the command points. Um, Relics of the Chapter is an interesting one because you spend those points before the game starts. 
you spend one command point for an extra relic um, or three command points for two extra relics for a total of three relics in your your army which is really cool um, the iron hand ones um, you can your vehicles can ignore penalties for moving and firing heavy weapons or for advancing and firing an assault weapon which is really cool those vehicles can get up close and fire stuff and ignore those penalties um, oh, excuse me only in death does duty end this one is, is interesting. It's two command points, and a model summons a strength for one final attack and can immediately shoot as if it were the shooting phase or fight if it was the fight phase. The stratum is not cumulative with the Stardis banner ability. The stratum takes precedence, which is, is really cool. Let's say someone goes in, and it's, it's for a character, I'm sorry, when an Adeptus is Stardis character. So someone comes in and assaults, and they get to go first, and they kill your character, right? Well, for two command points, you can make sure that that character still gets his attacks and maybe gets his revenge there and you end up doing some serious damage to whatever killed him. Uh, here's the cool thing. Now, the Warlord traits, you lose the Index Warlord traits. But um, there's some in here that are basically similar to the Index Warlord traits, but better. Okay, <laughs> they're like the Index Warlord traits plus on steroids. Hey, how you doing, Robo Pug? Um, and we'll talk about these. Angel of Death. Um, subtract one from the leadership characteristic of enemy units that were within six inches of a warlord. That's really good. Um, there's better ones, especially like the chapter-specific ones. But, I mean, leadership isn't the greatest thing, but if you can do a lot of damage and then lower that leadership, you can cause cause some stuff to go away. Imperium Sword, reroll fatal charge war rolls for your Warlord. In addition, if your Warlord charges in the charge phase, add one to his attack characteristics until the end of the fight phase. So an extra attack, and he gets to reroll charge charge rolls. Pretty cool. Uh, add one to the wounds character. Iron Resolve, add one to the wounds characteristics of your Warlord. And this is basically the same as the basic one where you roll a six to ignore wounds, but it, it's got the extra of adding a wound. On a roll of six, your warlord shrugs off the damage and does not lose the wound. So each time you take a wound, you roll a six and you shrug off, but you get an additional wound on top of that. So it adds a wound to your character and then you um, can shrug off those wounds, which is cool. Storm of Fire. Each time you roll a wound roll of six for a friendly chapter unit within six inches of warlord, uh, the armor penetration of that is increased by one. So what they mean by that is it gets better so AP minus one AP minus two it's not if it's AP minus one it becomes AP zero not doesn't work that way it works the other way and they actually explain that right there in the text rights of war friendly chapter units within six inches of war automatically pass morale tests uh, this one I don't, not a big thing for space marines space especially if you're running ultramarines because ultramarines basically they get plus one their leadership now just for their chapter tactic so if you've got a sergeant in attack squad in your tactical squads basically a sergeant character in your squads uh your leadership nine with ultramarines so uh you've got to lose a lot of guys to have chances of messing up uh the the uh thing and just uh just no it's just not um I don't, I don't know if this is really the awesomest thing. Maybe it's in that situation where you've got that, that you really have to pass a test. You've got a unit that lost a ton of guys and they're holding an objective. That would be a thing. But then the warlord would have to be within six inches of that. So, yeah, hard to see where that one would come in too much for space marines currently. Um, Champion of Humanity, you can add one to all hit and wound rolls made by this warlord in the fight phase when targeting enemy characters. So it turns him into a character killer, which is really good for uh, Black Templars, because Black Templars are wanting to be in close combat, and so you're probably wanting to be in there in close combat, and so just getting that would be great. But if you're a named Black Templar character, you have a better one over here. So, 
here's the way this works. You have these generic ones, and then you have these. If your character is just an unnamed HQ, you can choose either. You can go either way. If your character is named, you have to pick the chapter-specific ones. Okay, we'll start with Ultramarines. This one, I think, is the one thing in the entire codex that could could cause problems. It's the one thing I'm really worried about as far as power creep and craziness. Uh, it's the Ultramarines one. Adept of the Codex. Whilst your Warlord is alive, roll a dice each time you spend a command point to use a stratagem. On a 5+, plus, that command point is immediately refunded. That's that's crazy. Um, that's a 33% a chance. I mean, I'm just going to grab some dice here. I've got some just sitting over on the side here. Let's say I use a 3-point stratagem, right? And so I'm going to roll one dice for each of those points. And, wow, I just got all three points back. That's probably not typical, but that, that something like that could happen. So I use Orbital Bombardment, three command points. And I've got Gilliman, so that's the three command points that Gilliman gave me, say. I use those three for the Orbital Bombardment. Boom, they're back. <laughs> I got them back. I can use them for something else now. Let's see if these dice are cheating. Maybe that's why they're over to the side. Oh, no, they're not cheating, but look at there. I got one of them back. Uh, let's try it again. Two of them back. None of them. So, you know, it can happen you get none back, but uh, mm, you can get all of them back, like that first roll. Uh, and uh, command points, the, the reason there's so few of them and you have to work to get them is because they can do some powerful things. I mean... Oh, man. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> that one, that's the only one I'm worried about. Uh, let's go under that. White Scars. Roll a dice each time your Warlord finishes a charge move with one inch of an enemy unit. On a 4+, plus, that unit suffers a mortal wound. <laughs> so every time your Warlord basically gets um, Hammer of Wrath, basically. A 4+, plus Hammer of Wrath. Kind of cool. Um... Imperial Fist, we get Architect of War. Imperial Fist units within six inches of your Warlord that are receiving the benefit of cover add one, an additional one to their saving throws against attacks with an AP characteristic of minus one. Now that's a complicated way of saying if you're Imperial Fist and you're in cover, you ignore AP minus one. It doesn't. You, you, you ignore uh, the AP minus one and you still have the cover save. So if you're Imperial Fist, uh, three up armor save in cover, which would go to a two up, and someone's firing an AP minus one at you, you're still a two up. Still a two up save. Crimson Fists have tenacious opponent. If there are at least ten enemy models within six inches of your warlord when he fights in the fight phase, add D3 to his attack. So go in against the hordes. Black Templar. This one is really good. I like this one. Your warlord can form a heroic intervention if the enemy are within six inches rather than three inches and can move up to six inches when doing so. That is a huge radius. Um, let's see. Let's see. Usually it's about about here. This was an enemy. So your people were fighting. And you were about there. You could rush in and do it. But now it is somewhere about there. Ish, maybe a little. That's huge. <laughs> That's huge. <laughs> you move all that way. You can come in. Heroic intervention. That that's huge. That is a huge one. Uh, salamanders. Uh, add one to the strength characteristic of your warlord. Yeah, yeah the salamanders. It's kind of like yeah, okay. Yeah, not the greatest. Ravengar. I mean, if Salamanders, if he didn't have a named HQ, it may be one of these other ones, like the Iron Resolve or something. But, uh, yeah. Maybe it might help somewhere. Ravengar. Silent Stalker. This one is the bomb combined especially with their relic. It's it's act, it's crazy good. Enemy units cannot fire Overwatch at your Warlord. <laughs> They can't shoot. Charge in with the Warlord first because they can't shoot Overwatch. No Overwatch versus your Warlord. Iron Hands. Each time you roll a hit of six for your Warlord, make an extra attack 
at the same target using the same weapon. Those do not generate more, so they don't stack on each other. So, wow. Big winners out of all that, I would say Raven Guard and Ultramarines. And I love Raven Guards. I love the Raven Guards one. And here's what, uh, here's the chapter relics. We have the ones we had before, Armor Indomitus, Shield Eternal, Standard to the Emperor Ascendant, Teeth of Terror, Primarch's Wrath, and the Burning Blade. Some different um, stats from Teeth of Terror is D3 additional tax. Burning Blade is a strength plus 2, AP minus 5 <laughs> weapon. It's only 1 damage, but AP minus 5. It, it's, wow, you're, you're taking your uh, phone save. Uh, the shield eternal replaces a uh, storm shield or combat shield, and it's plus three in bone save, and any damage they suffer is halved rounding up. So if a weapon it does d6 damage, your opponent rolls four, you only take two damage instead of four. The armor indomitus is a two plus save. Once per battle, you can activate the force field for a 3-up and vulnerable for the remainder of that turn. Cool. Um, some new stuff. Um, Toma Malkador. That's that's the only non chat These are the general ones. Uh, this is one of the general ones. It's it's for psychers only. The bearer of the Tome knows one additional psychic power from Liberius Discipline. Yeah, okay, but you can only cast so many. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, here we go. Uh, Salamander's Mantle can only be used for Salamanders. The wearer gets a toughness characteristic of one. So if you're putting this Warlord, you're going to have strength boost by one, toughness boost by one. You're, you're making a big, tough dude here. Uh, the Axe of Medusa is a plus two strength, minus three AP, damage two. It's Iron Hands only. Raven's Fury. This is what I'm telling you about the Raven Guard. This, this combined with the Warlord trait. Uh, the bearer of the Raven's Fury can advance and charge in the same turn. Furthermore, he can re-roll failed charge rolls. Hey, Derek, how you doing? We're just discussing the Codex here on the YouTubes. And I love this one. Derek and I were talking about this one. Uh, we were talking about this one on the podcast, too. This is, this is crazy good. Your Warlord can just go, like, he's going to get into combat with whoever he wants with the Raven's Fury. He's going to get across the table, and he's going to, like, just be in their face. <laughs> and that's it. And, and say you use the command point. So I don't know what the Raven's Guards kind of their dudes might have, but say take the Raven's Fury, right, and you use your command points to do some of these other, you know, things here of getting extra attacks and re-rolling the wounds in combat. And he's just going to go in there and wreck face. But the biggest thing is, like, Say you have a unit that you want to get in close combat. Um, say like the Primaris uh, Assault guys with their, all their power fists and stuff. But there's only a unit of three. So if they get lucky in Overwatch, you might lose one or two of those guys. And that's not cool. So you just have your Ravens guy with a Ravens jet pack, your HQ bounce in there. They can't shoot Overwatch at him. He locks them up and then they run in and power fist everybody down, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> I forget what those assault guys are, but they have all the flamers and the dual power fists, the, the primaris guys. So, the, you know, let them come, him come in first, bounce in, lock him up, and then they run in and power fist him down. And the good thing is because he has such awesome movement, he can be behind them so that he can't be targeted by shooting, and then he rushes up, locks the other guys in combat, and then they can come in. So I like that. It almost makes me want to paint my army black. Aggressors, that's right. Aggressors want me to go repaint my whole army back and become Raven's Guard. Because that's cool. Because I like jump packs too. But, you know, I don't know. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> uh, the White Scars get a Psyker only one too, which is kind of weird. Never, not, never thought of them as a Psyker kind of force. Uh, but they get to add one to their psychic test when t attempting to manifest smite. So that's a four up on smite. That's that's pretty much nearly you're going to get smite. Uh, the crimson's kiss fists get the fist of vengeance. Of course, they're all about fisted in the fists. Uh, it's times two strength minus three AP damage three straight up three, and it doesn't mention anything about the minus one to hit for that that weapon. So, yeah. Hitting on your regular 
melee to hit, which for a lot of characters is going to be a two up, maybe, and then passion people. So that's kind of cool. Uh, Ultramarines get the Sancti Kalo, which is a three up and vulnerable save, and they can attempt to deny one psychic power in the enemy psychic phase. So, <laughs> what? Yeah, I saw uh, Mini Wargaming. I saw, Derek, I saw a, um, they did a one with the Salamanders, and it was crazy. The guy was, literally, here's the dice, it's like, he's doing his attacks, and he's rolling his attacks, and oh, I get to roll this because of the, the lieutenant, and then I get to re-roll this because of uh, my Salamanders trait. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, I had three misses there, but now they're all three hits, <laughs> and it's like, what is a re-rolling? <laughs> crazy that re-rolls are real with uh, the salamanders uh so this is kind of cool though the, the ultramarines it says ultramarines captain though ultramarines captain uh you can t use a command point to through or three command points to make a captain a chapter master it says it replaces the model's captain keyword with chapter master. So uh, there's going to have to be a fact in there about can you have this relic on a captain that you turned into a chapter master. Because currently, I guess the answer to that would be no. Because you no longer have the captain's keyword because it's been replaced with chapter master. So I think they're, they're probably, they're, they will fact that as yes, you can. Because it would be kind of silly that captains could run around with a 3-up and vulnerable save, deny psychic powers, Halo, but the chapter master can't do that. Yep, re-roll, re-roll, re-roll the <laughs> vultures. Yeah, if you combine um, lieutenants with salamanders, with um, uh, captains, and then Vulcan... You have to have like tokens or something to keep track of what's re rolled so you don't re roll re rolls. <laughs> uh, the Crusader's Helm. This is Black Templars only. Uh, what this does is basically increases the range of any aura abilities on a status sheet since Rites of Battles, Litany's Hate, etc. by three inches. So I think most of those are six inch auras. So it brings them out to nine inch auras, which is, is a lot. That's a big range. That's a nice bubble of those abilities, and those abilities are really cool. Rerolling and, and extra attacks and all that stuff. The Imperial Fist get this. It's the Spartan. It's a 12-inch range. Pistol 2, so two shots with it. Strength 4, AP minus 1, 2 damage. Pretty cool on that, but the ability is... The weapon can target enemy characters even if they are not the closest model. Where this comes into effect is... Uh, the now in one of the changes in the book that I didn't mention earlier was that captains on bikes gained a pistol so you can swap this model the pistol out for that model on that bike you can have a guy who can zip around on the bike uh, it's got range got toughness a little bit of durability with this weapon and he can go out and target characters and put some hurt on them which is pretty cool You had, let me see, you had uh, Vulcan, Stern Guard, Combi Meltas. Vulcan gave all the Meltas who roll, re-roll ones of the Bolters and then re-roll one of the Mists that wasn't one. Yeah, see? <laughs> so, <laughs> that's just crazy. You missed it earlier, but I was rolling, I went to roll three dice to uh, to demonstrate the re-rolling for command points. I said, hey, Orbital Bombardment, three command points, so I'll roll three dice. And this, I, I literally got like a six, six, and a five on the first roll. <laughs> it's like, what? So yeah, it's possible to get all three of those command points back too. So that Ultramarine one is going to be crazy too. Uh, their Psychic Powers, um, overall, they're okay. Um, a lot of Mortal Wound doing get Psychic Scourge. It's warp charge value of six. And, and the big thing I didn't mention is um, one of these allows you to basically do the Librarius Conclave thing and what you do Empiric Channeling for only one command point. If you have uh, three Psychers and they're they're within six inches of each other, you can use this and then one Psyker can immediately attempt to manifest an additional Psychic Power. 
and when attempting it's minus two on the psychic test so a lot of these you could really if you had to had to had to get them off you can drop a lot of these down to like four ups and stuff like that so veil of time is six six um this is warp charge seven this is warp charge five so you could drop that down to a three up to make psychic fortress and null zone null zone is one of the big ones i think to mention it's a warp charge value of eight so hard to get off unless you do something with like different psychers and use that command uh, point option but if you get it up off um until the start of your next psychic phase while anybody is within six inches of the psycher model uh enemy model well what enemy models are within six inches they cannot take invulnerable saves and must have the result of the psychic test rounded up that they the, must half the result result of psychic tests that they take so if they're trying to cast psychic powers they they like i gotta manifest smite on a five they roll that that's an eight well no that's not because that's not it's a four and they fail because they gotta half that so crazy good crazy good against the zeech demon force uh because if you can get close uh demons are relying on their invul saves so you can um blank out those invul saves you can stop those smites from coming down with this power so definitely uh that's another option is bringing in the three psychers using the command point so you can put a hurting on the demons at least one time pretty pretty awesome getting the six up you know well i can't seem to get it now for some let's use this dice there you go got the six up got it off <laughs> and then maybe working on the eight up so you try it each turn you know you can try it's just a dice roll yeah the relic that allows them to know additional power combine that with empiric channeling yeah, because you can pick your powers, and so what you want to do is maybe give him the relic that allows him to know an additional power. So, say he can cast two powers normally, you pick two that you're going to use all the time. Maybe Psychic Scourge, because you can do the Mortal Wounds and uh, Might of Heroes or something. And then, you for the extra power, you pick Null Zone, because I might need to get this power off. But it's not one I want to waste my uh, carrying around. But it's a good backup option. So it allows you to get that good backup option power of Null Zone. I have not seen anywhere that has a point values for the relics. No, I have looked. And I cannot find point values for the relics. I just, I don't know. I guess the, you just, you can choose a relic. Unless you pay command points, then you can choose up to, you know, three relics. Or two or three relics. I've looked. The, the, the relics, they're just there. There's no point values for relics. None whatsoever. Unless that was like supposed to be here in the back and it just didn't get glued in or something in the codex. Um, yeah, the, they're, they're not listed in the weapon. So let's just take Tisa Terra is a, a close range weapon, right? So it should be listed in melee weapons and it's not there. It's not in that list, so it's not in other war gear. Uh, of course, why would it be in ranged weapons? But we'll look. We'll look in the T's right here. T's, just, uh, no. Twin last cannons, not there. And this is point values. So, yeah. Just take a relic. Just take a relic. Yeah, the Salamander's flat plus one. I was talking about that. So when you're doing the Salamander's guys, you're just making him plus toughness plus one. His warlord trait makes him strength. So you're basically just a big, strong guy getting in the fight and doing some massive damage. The only thing is like a lot of the, the side chapters, Derek, like um, Imperial Fist and Salamander's and all that stuff. We need more characters. We need more characters. We need some guys. Like Imperial Fist, you got Lysander. <laughs> I mean, you can go generic captains and stuff like that and lieutenants, but we need, we need more named guys, some cool guys, so we can do, add some cool stuff to them. It's unfortunate. So yeah, so that is crazy. Now, here's what uh, tactical objectives. Remember what I was talking about? I said uh, you've either got the... Um, the uh, White Scars, where you use command point to char or um, advance and still shoot and fire. I'm going to go straight to this last one, because and or the Raven Guard, where he has a jump pack and can move and advance and do all that stuff. Uh, this 
if you get number 16, it says score D3 victory points if you control an objective marker that was controlled by your opponent at the start of the turn. If you control three or more objective markers that were controlled by your opponent at the start of the turn, score D3 plus three victory points instead. Now, why is this important? This is super important now because if you pull this in an objective-based game, right now in your Space Marines, you have objective secured. You can just take the objective. You don't have to kill the opponent off. You just have to get close enough to take the objective. Two, you have a lot of options for moving very fast and getting to objectives that are, are a decent distance away across the table. And three, it's D3 plus three victory points for three. I mean, even if you just get one, that's D3 victory points. I, I usually say, look, three, you got three. <laughs> but I mean, D3 plus three, you, three victory points, a total of maybe six victory points. Six victory points. Six victory points. Can you, Six victory points. That is a that's a huge swing. <laughs> um, yeah, so that can be really good. And until other people get their codexes out, I'm sure other people are going to have some kind of objective type thing. Maybe, maybe not, but oh, maybe just giving Marines uh, that would be kind of well interesting. But uh, maybe maybe heretic guys will get it too. The chaos. We'll see. The chaos codex is coming out soon. Maybe they get something similar. It seems like a lot of their armies that we've seen so far are basically like the evil version of these guys. Like the, there's in their um, their chapter tactics of the um, the the one guys that showed us was the same as the imperial fist. So so maybe they will have that because that that will be something they might need because this is this is a lot of points here. Uh, the other ones are eleven death from above. Score a victory point. At least one enemy unit was destroyed in your turn. And the last model in the enemy unit slain was slain by a model that had the fly keyword. Uh, so, assault marines, whatever. Whatever you have that has fly. Uh, honor your chapter. Score a victory point if enemy character lost a wound as a result of an attack made by one of your characters. If he was actually slaying, you get D3 victory points. So, if one of your characters slays a character, you get D3. Uh, score victory point if at least one enemy unit was destroyed or failed a morale test this turn. If three or more units were destroyed or failed a morale test, score D3 victory points. Um, you have to do a lot of damage. This is like if you like salamanders with flamers or imperial fists with your bolters, uh, boltering people down, you might be able to kill enough guys in different units to get that. Uh, but it's, it's okay. It's the same as we've had before. For the emperor, emperor, score victory point if one or more of your infantry biker units made a successful charge. Infantry or biker units, sorry, made a successful charge during this turn. So all you gotta do is charge. That, that's pretty good. And Raven Guard. I mean, I can see Raven Guard having a, a good thing on this because all you gotta do is charge and then take the objective. And <laughs> you have the fly keyword with your jump pack. You can get, Raven Guard. Maybe I need to be playing Raven Guard, Derek. <laughs> Lightning Strike. Score victory point of at least one enemy unit that was entirely within the deployment zone at the start of the turn was destroyed during this turn. Uh, Terminators, anything can deep strike. You could get that with. So, But this is a good one. I like this last one. So these are your specialist ones, 11 through 16. And then they have some nice pictures for us. And then as we mentioned before, there are no points for the relics. And that's what, um, yeah, that's interesting. Relics. You just get relics. Just, just get one. Just, why not? Why would you not have a relic in your list? Why would you not have one? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. You think you can get my whole army painted black and ready to go by the next tournament? <laughs> oh, some very beautiful things here. But yeah, I just wanted to go over the codex. I didn't want to go into depth with any of these. Uh, profiles or anything like that because I know other people have I just wanted to point out some changes and details with you guys really quick I have regular normal videos not not um, live stream where I go to the data cards and the uh, these cool objectives I put them together I uh, put them together already too Pretty cool. Yeah, yellow is not too hard. To, yellow is hard to paint, not to cover up. It's easy to cover up. Uh, let me show you. I'll show you these before I go. Um, 
so what I did is I just used some of my um, tiles left over from my imperial terrain so I put that one on there like that that's a little communications array put the little exterminatus bomb on that one it's good they cut off the skulls on the bottom so they sit nice and flat uh, I made this one ammo dump one right here added a little dagger and melt the bomb and some ammo packs here I put this one closed there's actually stuff in there ammo boxes but you know I don't want them all to be open uh, put them here I did a little um, had a old dreadnought base with a pod I put a little marine here injured tech uh, tech marine here let's get the little pilot tech marine pilot basically put him down here with a drop pod or the escape pod got him like that <laughs> getting yellow in there. Imperial fists are yellow so people can see us and know we're coming and run. That's why. Uh, I got this on the same base. A little computer screen. Giant computer server, I guess. Uh, I just did a simple one for this one. Just on a smaller base with the two bombs. These are really can be used for ammo dumps. You really get you basically get six objective markers. And then two that you can use for ammo dumps or other objective markers. This one I haven't glued because I want to be able to paint it. But I basically carved away so this would sit flat on there. You can see I carved this up. And this will sit flat like this. And then I've got an injured marine here. Also a marine pilot because, as you can see, look. Ah, it's pilot seat. That's how he can lay flat on the bed. Like that. Got him. He's an injured. And then this sits like this will be like over that, but I definitely want to be able to paint all these things individually and then assemble them together. So I've got that one, and it is on two bases, but it still makes a good ejector. And then the last one is this right here, and this is also not completely assembled, but it's a little pod that has a guy in it because I definitely have to paint all of this stuff inside here, and I want to paint this separately before gluing it before I get that all together. But yeah, so I got them assembled, and I have a video on the show you the sprue and all that stuff. They're pretty cool. They were at the store when we went to the tournament this uh, this weekend, and so I picked them up. I just couldn't stop myself adding to the Gracie. But uh, let me see. That's uh, I had eight eight things to the Gracie, but I got rid of uh, thirty because I painted the, the zombies. So, net gain against the Gray Sea. Net gain. Working hard on it. And me and LT are going to be painting his orcs that he has. Um, we're going to do these on videos, on live streams. So, uh, when we start painting next, he'll go. We're going to be doing the skin for all of them. I'm going to, uh, He's going to actually be doing it. Uh, for the most part. If, if, he need, if he really needs or wants help with small details, I will do that for him. Uh, but I'm really trying to just give him a chance to paint them up on his own and uh, do them. And, uh, you know, some of them may may not look the greatest when they're done, of course, because he's just eight and starting out and everything. But I think uh, that that's really going to help him to develop. And he probably he may paint them better than I do. He may start painting better than I He's, he's got skills. All right, guys. Well, I've been talking long enough. And... Uh, I will uh, have some regular videos up. The camera has just finished downloading the video, so I'll edit it in the uh, editing video editing thing here in a little bit. Yeah, yeah, he's going to paint his own. Only thing is, you know, if he says, hey, can you help me, like, let's see, let, look at this war boss here. Mm, if he says, hey, can you help me paint that belt buckle better, I might paint it up a little bit there for him but I'm not going not, I would say 99 to 100 percent of it is going to be him he, he base coated these all uh, I did not base coat any of these 10 orcs at all and uh, I just told him here's what you do here's the paint here's the brush that you need to use um, I did thin the paint down for him to show him the consistency so he'd know and I'd, I'd you know just let him go with the technique and he he did base coat all of those by himself here's one that he did in green earlier um, when he was just first kind of testing out at it and so now I'm going to have him uh, we can throw, actually throw this in the two paint pile here um, we did this one together right here 
I already based it and put a little rock on there for him. Uh, but it was mostly just silver and some red. And some I painted the wires here for him. In different colors to give it a little bit extra extra for him. And that was one of his killer cans. He's got two more of these that need painted. When it's done, he'll have a, a decent painted army. So that's great. Yeah, I I don't I didn't I don't strip my models. Um, my older models, I still keep them. I keep them around and I play with them and I use them. And I use them as a. It's almost like a a three D living history of my painting abilities as they progressed. And one of my oldest models, he he just looks he was horrible. Looks like he was dipped in a bucket of of paint and wing, winged off, and then like splotched details on with like a a, a cotton toothpick or something like that. He, 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 <laughs> you guys have seen pictures of him. I've had him up on the Facebook and stuff like that. But I, I just keep him around because he's a reminder of me whenever I'm painting something and. Um, because under these super bright lights, when I have all of them on, you just see all of the flaws, no matter what you try. All of the flaws. And you're never going to get rid of all of those flaws. Um, but he's a reminder to me of, hey, look at what you've created here. You know, this with this with the zombie. Look at this. That's pretty good compared to where you were. You're getting better. You're doing better each time. So just keep at it. So, yeah, and these will probably be that for him. These will probably be bet for them. And also I hope, what I also hope they will be for him is, uh, you know, in the future when he moves on, maybe if this is something that he plays later on, or even if it's just stuff that sits on a shelf in his house and maybe his, his kids ask him about what were those, and he can be like, this is something I did with my dad. You know, and that will be a reminder of, of good times with me and his dad and stuff. So that's another reason why I want to do that with him. Yeah, very cool. Alrighty, I am now going to say goodbye to everybody. Uh, it was nice chatting with you. Uh, Derek, awesome. I, I've got the podcast completed, uh, so you know Derek, and uh, uh, to Chandler, so he's going to go through it like he normally does and then get it up where it needs to be. So the podcast should be up. Uh, I did... I edited it down to two it's two and a half hours of us actually talking and um it it, it it's run time is about 245 but that's the starting music and then the end music i, I let the end music play the whole music thing because yeah whatever so it's actually about about two hours i believe two hours and 35 minutes of chat for anybody who watches this wants to it's come the apocalypse um is the podcast you can find it on apple the itunes and all that stuff and um and you come to the apocalypse facebook page you can go there and you can look on it it's just um it's most it, it's about promoting our local gt but we do talk about the, the space marine codex and a lot of cool stuff each day and so if you want to go take a listen to that go ahead and take a listen to that it is a pretty interesting thing a lot of different opinions Derek is the more um, down to earth let's see kind of person Chandler is the very technical how can we cheese this kind of guy um, Dan is is very quiet but he's very uh, and quiet and reserved but he uh, has great insights into things and um, uh, brings a lot of the emotion to the game. And me, I'm more of the, ah, this, what is going on here? <laughs> they need to fix this sometimes. Sometimes I can get a bit jumpy about things. But hey, it is what it is. You bring all that together and you get a great uh, a great show about uh, the, the hobby and what's coming around and going around. Yeah, yeah, you are, Derek. You're all everybody's like the sky is falling and GW must die. Get the pitchforks, and you're always like, well, maybe we don't need to do the pitchforks. Maybe we can just discuss this. <laughs> all righty, guys. Truly, in enough, I will say goodbye. Thank you very much for watching. I know your time is valuable, and I appreciate you spending some of it with me. I enjoy it, and I will talk to you later.